last year, I've watched most of the sessions, not all the dream sessions, but most of the others, and I'm very uh, excited to join you. Great. I mean, the one thing I, uh, I think that we try to focus on, and I don't say it's absolutely necessary, but it's uh, you don't um, you don't uh, uh, read a cookbook just for to read it. You you read a cookbook to cook. So I mean, the idea of, of reading young is to do young, you know. And I absolutely. think absolutely, yeah. I think sometimes people get caught in the uh, and and you know that's one thing reason a lot of the things we've done have been very. Uh, much to do with um, practical analysis, you know, now that we're going to finish the feminine and fairy tales. But after that, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we did only got half through a, a, a one, you know, one of the most underrated uh, Jungians is a guy named Gerhard Adler. And he was actually Jung's uh, interpreter for a while. I mean, his yeah, interpreted to English for a while, but um he, he did a, an analysis. The whole analysis is in a, a book called The Living Symbol. And it is of a woman who had a very damaged feeling function and, her, and also a very negative animus. And yet what, what Ger, Gerhard Adler, the thing I really love about him more than any, anything is he is completely amazed by every, I mean, this is one thing Edinger said that uh, is, uh, he thought it was uh, just such a honor to, for 40 years, to listen to the contents of the unconscious, you know, that came to him, you know, fresh and uh, just, uh, and, and then to, to go through it, uh, you, you know, I'm just, I'm, um, I, I just had this thought about it this week, you know, that these, it, it just working with your own dreams, I mean, just how amazing these things are. And we just, uh, I mean, each line to me is, uh, is astounding. Did I dream that? Mm -hmm. I dream that. And, and, and what I was uh, coming to, and we're going to come in, I just, we're going to digress one uh, session here. Uh, I'm going to, I'll start the uh, recording now. Just uh, uh, so we get, this is what we put on YouTube. I didn't mean to. Okay. I was mis mixed up there. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, we'll, uh, what, what I was, um, this, this uh, aspect of uh, what I thought, um, I'd read this in Hillman about um, this article about musical therapy and uh, what, what musical therapy is. And uh, uh, let's just go through it because I think it's a, the point I was going to make is that the dream maker has every single aspect of everything that's ever happened in the history of human beings and every, every other form of life in its uh, toolbox and it can bring it out. And it, it's really bringing it out to uh, to uh, uh, to have our psyche develop in the way that the acorn within us uh, was meant to develop. I mean, they, we need the self-willed ego because it helps create the philosopher's stone. But the self-willed ego often uh, thinks that it is the um, uh, it, it is the uh, king. When it's not the king, you know, it's the, uh, it is, a, it's meant to be in service. And we're going to find this out in this, just this wonderful little short essay that I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Thomas More. He's from Dallas, you know, but um, he yeah. is, uh, did you say something, Aline? Or No. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, he's, he's from uh, Dallas. Uh, and he writes a lot about soul, and so does Hillman, you know, uh, so, uh, but I was going to uh, show as just kind of an introductory. Uh, hi, Dahlia. Yeah, oh, you're from Hello. College Station. That's great. You know, Texas A&M and University of Texas. 
Okay, uh, let's see, we got, um, I'm gonna uh, quick uh, just show you uh, this thing about, um, now this, is, this is what we're gonna kind of be facing with this uh, subject is uh, this. You know, which is, this is just an example, but every one of these, uh, you, you know, it's just amazing that the Greeks came up with these gods uh, who personify archetypal energies, you know. But here, every word, uh, this is from Edinger. He, he, this is what he calls cluster thinking. This is how the psyche thinks. You know, the psyche thinks um, it, it takes all these images and it wraps it around a separate uh, concept. But anyway, um, we'll, we'll go into that, but I'm gonna read the, the end of this little uh, essay first, and then um, we'll, uh, uh, oh, you're from College Station. Okay, all right. Okay, well, I just wanna read this, this last uh, uh, little part about um, the, um, what uh, we're going to talk about what musical therapy is and uh, versus music therapy. And, and so he's talking about the image of the musical therapist. This is a person who has an ear for the psychological overtones in all events represented especially by the planetary gods. Now we saw that, that uh, little a uh, uh, thing that Edinger did. You know, there are um, uh, uh, indigenous uh, religions that don't have, that aren't polytheistic. The the uh, aspect of the of the um, musical therapist is he's not he's not monocentric. He's polycentric as the psyche is. Okay, and uh, we're going to hear this from Marsilio Vicino in just a second. But um, this is a person who has ear for the psychological overtones and events represented especially by the planetary gods. That is the archetypal images behind events. Now, we were just talking earlier, Marion Woodman said one time, Cat uh, 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 was talking about how uh, when there's vibrations, you can see the sand form certain patterns on whatever is vibrating. Marion Woodman says, "If you, it, our 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 um, our 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 entity is is when it faces events is like throwing metal filings onto a piece of paper, which secretly has thousands of magnets under. It. You know that those metal filings tend to cluster in one spot uh, and and form a pattern." So the archetypal images behind events. So the mag musical therapist has an ear, not an insight, but an ear for spiritual overtones. The, the angelic connecting, analogical, that means uh, and, uh, making analog, ana analogies, subtle and volatile links between body and soul. Where's ego in that? You know, it's not really um, that ego almost stands apart. Drawing on the imagery we uh, we discuss here, we can describe the musical therapist as one who perceives the tuning of the soul. Okay, uh, it distinguishes its tonality, the basic spheres or tones which constitute its own deep seated scale. Now, how does scale form? That's an interesting question, too. He appreciate, appreciates that consonants or harmony and dissonance or disharmony are both desirable ingredients of the soul's music. Might be stability and instability, too. Hi, Azine. Let's get Hi. started. He has an aesthetic attitude towards the function of ego. In other words, the ego has an aesthetic function. 
He evaluates the patterns and movements of the soul as to whether they are fitting. And that's a very important word. Are they fitting and appropriate rather than either natural, moral, or normal? You know, Jung used to say, too, that there is no such thing as a sin unless you feel inside yourself that you're sinning. You know, unless you feel it's a sin, uh, who are you sinning against? You're sinning, sinning against uh, uh, the um, unfolding uh, rhizome within yourself or some uh, relationship that you have with the Tao. You know, I think this, uh, you touched on these mysteries, uh, Aline, in, in what uh, this seminarian told you is the, um, the mystery of extroversion. You know, there is, is anyway, this, um, uh, the, the, the idea is, is whatever we are doing, is it fitting and appropriate uh, for this moment? For the musical therapist, a personal life is not a story, but a melody. It's expressive and moving. This is a very important word in musical therapy. It's a composition of many melodies in harmony and counterpoint, long or short, massively orchestrated or played with simplicity. Behind the tunes sounds the pre-compositional archetypal modes and scales. So behind the tunes of our life, the melodies of our life, uh, sound the pre-compositional archetypal uh, modes and scales. And this is human music that gives life its tone and resonance. It's called musica humana. humana. Um, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. I just thought I'd read the end there because it kind of puts everything else in context. Uh, so that, who wrote uh, that? Who wrote that? Uh, who, was, who wrote this? Yes. Uh, Thomas Moore. I'll Thomas put Moore. a link in the uh, chat of the, uh, of the text. It's actually from uh, 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 the, uh, the Spring, which is a, uh, um, you know, Hillman used to uh, be the editor of Spring, and uh, let me see if I can find it real quick here. Uh, but it, it's only eight pages long, and it's just a, a wonderful uh, little thing. Well, I'll put it in in a second uh, before we're done, Diane. Okay. And of course, I'll put you on the mailing list, and we'll have all the yeah. uh, all okay. of them. Okay, so uh, we're we're basically talking about uh, music therapy, which is this ancient concept of connecting music and the soul and it um it, it's uh um or more deeply it's it's effects and more more deeply its source uh uh the uh source of music or the effects of music on the soul now uh he gives some examples that, you know plato used to say try to avoid certain notes or scales you know, uh, mid the medieval church in, in during fasting periods would, um, to try to keep everybody up, would say, pound the organ. You know, in other words, uh, the, uh, um, they're going to uh, play the music very loud. Um, and uh, music can soothe the savage beast. Everyone's heard about this. So this, this is the idea of, of this um, musical music therapy. Now, Marsilio Ficino, is a, a Platonist of the Renaissance practice music therapy with both instruments and voice. And it's kind of interesting too, you know, I mean, uh, well, just, uh, he'll tell about this in a second, but so there's no secret, there is a psychological value in music, but what is less widely known is there are musical values in psyche, you know, and this is what his essay about, and uh, so he calls this musical therapy. And it's not music therapy. It's, it is about um, that there are musical values in psyche, not that there's psychological value in music. So um, he's, he, music therapy 
will use recordings, instruments, and sound to alter uh, the mood of the ego, you know, or maybe um, to have a person be less depressed or something. The, uh, and the low level of this is Muzak, which is, you know, in elevator music. And the high level at the best is the um, recognition of the values to soul uh, of the art of music in all its variety. Okay. So, but musical therapy is, um, is a uh, discovery of a music of the soul. And this may be altogether silent. There's no violins, no singing, no audible vibrations, only the movements. And that's what's important here. The movements of the soul, they move. Its elemental fact, uh, factors are scales and tunings, melodies and harmonies. And so soul makes a music, which only then can be re presented in performed and recording, recorded music. So the music comes out of, the music that we hear in the outer world comes out of the soul's music. Now this, this is interesting. Uh, you know, there was this Japanese geneticist uh, back, you know, when they first discovered DNA and they, they, you know, they had these Moog synthesizers and he assigns uh, like a, a note to all the, uh, different uh, genomes, you know, and so then he plays, plays it on the Moog synthesizer to hear what does this DNA sound like? So he could get sort of a feel for it, you know, and when, when he played it of the, um, of the clear transparent covering of the eye, it sounded, sounded like Vivaldi's Four Seasons. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but it's just this wonderful lifting music and, and, uh, when he played it of, uh, of uh, um, cancerous Oko gene, it sounded like Chopin's Death March. And that just was his little, his feeling for the, the sound of that uh, genome. So anyway, um, uh, the music that we hear is the represented melodies, harmonies, scales, and tunings that come out of the movements of the soul. And, uh, um, but in itself, the, the music of the soul is audible only to the inner ear, an inner ear that is tuned to the fundamentals, those, that's the tones and the overtones, which are the partials of a tone of the soul. And uh, um, this notion is uh, nothing new, it was, uh, um, during the period of the Middle Ages, which really, uh, he means around 600 AD, uh, and the Renaissance, which was um, in the 14 and 1500s. It was called Musica Humana. Now, there's a guy named Bothus. Um, he's, he was um, a, a council of... Uh, um, of Rome uh, for Theodoric. Theodoric was a um, was the second Gothic uh, emperor of Rome. His his predecessor was named Odacer, who was the one that overthrew the last Roman emperor. So and and um, and both us was uh, was born in that uh, during that time. And he became uh, the council of uh, Theodoric. But he said that their music had three parts. There was musica instrumentalis. That's music that we hear with the ears. And music mundana, which uh, has something to do with the world. Music made by the movements of nature, the circling of the planets, and the ryth rhythms of the seasons. And then there is the third aspect, which is musica humana, music created, created from the counterpoint of the virtues, moods, and feelings experienced within the person himself. 
That's musica humana. So it's um, through musica humana is a way of imagining the soul. Now its chief merit is that it pictures the soul in movement. It's really a consciousness. You know, I mean, the, the idea of uh, you can go through all life uh, and, and be unconscious, but you can also sit inside yourself and feel movements in you of, of effect or uh, moods or something and be aware of them, intensely aware. Who came up with the uh, Kundalini Yoga? You know, it was someone that was very in tune with the soul uh, soul's music and uh, um, so uh, it uh, describes the soul's movement the movement of the kundalini snake in metaphors uh, uh, that are other than visual so the goal of musica humana is developing a good ear as in distinct from gaining an insight into the soul. Now, the musical fundamentals of soul are um, so in, in a monocentric sense. This is this is what uh, we're trying to break out of. Harmony, in its usual sense, comes from uh, is to harmonize uh, one's life, is to bring all the bits and pieces together in the service of some overreaching egoistic intent. So in ordinary music, harmony, for the most part, is a system of arranging the tones of a composition as a function of a single tone or key tone. And uh, uh, he, he mentions Mozart's, uh, Mozart's uh, G minor symphony, which uh, G is the ego of the piece, uh, and it sets the piece in motion. It structures its every moment and makes the final cadence final. However, there is a much older meaning for the word har harmony in music theory. I listened to the, this, uh, my, I, if I could, if I was like Gary, I could play a little bit of it, but the older, older meaning for the word harmony in music theory um, reflects the polycentric nature of the soul. Now, this is the idea that within us, there are many, many energies. And this, you know, this comes from that um, uh, sort of Hindu meditation of neti neti. I, I see through my eyes, I am not my eyes. I hear through my ears, I am not my ears. And you, you know, I feel with my fingers, but I'm not my fingers. You can go through all of these. So your fingers, and, and you know, some of the meditations that Gary does, uh, really uh, say, you, you know, when, when and in, um, I, I also think in craniosacral therapy, I did this for a while. Uh, it is amazing how someone can, uh, I've got feet, you know? I mean, you know, it, you suddenly feel your feet as, as kind of a divine God, you know? And then uh, one, one thing they do is, is they put a little circle, they just put a circle over your heart you know, and I just felt light coming in. You know, it's just all these uh, different areas in us. Now, this is the body, but the soul also has these areas. So this older uh, meaning is, uh, is the polycentric nature of the soul, that there is no one center. There's any number of centers. Now, in Pythagorean music theory, one creates harmony by creating a scale by tempering and tuning. Now, what's what interesting is that, um, you know, music uh, is uh, is uh, if you if you listen to uh, just the, all the tones at once, like say you go into a uh, uh, Las Vegas casino where they've got all the all the uh, one armed bandits playing at one time. I think you're going to hear the non-differentiated, non-tempered uh, uh, sounds of the universe. You know, they just, um, you just hear this one tone, but, um, but uh, um, there can't be any music without uh, a, a tempered scale. 
Now the tempered scale means, um, is it going to be uh, seven notes to an octave, like the white keys on the piano? Or is it gonna be five keys to an octave, like the black keys on a piano? You know, I mean, it, it's kind of fun sometimes to hear somebody play a, a song using only the black keys of the piano or only the white keys of the piano. I mean, it sounds a little different. But anyway, um, before music can begin, the infinite possible tones within reach of an octave, one octave, they call it a, an octave eight, but you know, it's basically got uh, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, and then do, which is just a repeat of the first one, but at, at, it's, the, it's the ending of this octave and the beginning of the next, you know, uh, but there's basically seven discrete tones. Now, if anybody, uh, I, I'm not a musical expert, so feel free to jump in. <laughs> a lot of this is uh, just my guesses. But be, before, uh, so the infinite possible tones within reach of an octave have to be reduced to a definite number, to a few clearly distinguished tones. Now, everything we're talking about here is leading towards the musical therapist, you know, the one who finds the music of the soul. And uh, they use the same techniques. So Pythagoras was measuring his single stringed instrument or uh, clanging some anvils, discovered this remarkable phenomenon that the purest intervals of scale correspond to the simplest mathematical proportions of measurement. Um, you know, there's the two to one, the three to two, which is a fifth, and then the four to three, which is the seventh notes. And with these simple proportions, we have the foundations of, of Western music. It's very interesting to listen to other musics that developed ever, elsewhere. Like um, if you ever listen to music from India, there's usually never a start or a finish. You know? <laughs> it just plays. You know, I mean, it's a kind of a more of a rhythmic type of thing without these um, short melodies. Um, so for Pythagoras, this discovery was astounding. In these, he believed he had found the secret structure for the entire universe. All things were built on number in proportions. So he demonstrated orally, or I mean by, by hearing. Now, this is the other thing. How mysterious is uh, this um, wordless hearing, you know, that of, of music. Um, he, dis, he, he um, uh, demonstrated the inescapable harmony of the musical scale. Um, so all things were built on number, including the cosmos and the soul. And he got this from the scale of scales of music. So from this Pythagorean uh, revelation, we get the idea of human music and of cosmic music. Um, and so what is especially significant for us is the uh, harmony in this context um, implies multiplicity, okay? To harmonize, harmonize is to distinguish, divide, and measure out multiplicities. Music uh, begins by making clear distinction, an infinite multiplicity, by the way the 10,000 things. Music begins by making clear distinctions among the fundamental elements and the tones of scale. So um, this harmonizing takes place before melodies are made. Before is understood as both temporal, temporally and structurally. Before a composer writes, he must know the characteristics of the distinct notes of a scale. Before a performer plays, he must tune his instrument so as to play the proper tones in their due proportions. And in the music itself, all the melodies consist, consist of an imaginative variation on scale tones and on the peculiar properties of their relationships. Okay, now that's with uh, musica instrumentalis, but it's also true with musica humana, 
and musica mundana, <laughs> or donas, the, the nature's music. So here then we arrive at the first principle of musical therapy. It is essential to develop a theory and an ear for the fundamental elements which lie at the root of human experiences. It's essential to develop a theory and an ear for the fundamental elements which lie at the root of human experiences. I think these are human soul experiences uh, more than uh, just random uh, accidents. Once again, we do not have to devise new metaphors to maintain the basic analogy for um, we have this centuries old tradition uh, points to the correspondence between the seven notes of the diatonic scale and the seven planets and their specific theories. Now, uh, this is um, very interesting because um, there is uh, a um, god associated with each uh, deity. You know, um, uh, the sun is some, somewhat of the uh, uh, itself is re represents a dominant of ego consciousness. So it would be probably the ego, uh, although, you know, Hellas, um, it's, it would be, could also be, could possibly be Apollo. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But then there is the moon, and then there is Mars, uh, who I think also could be Athena, and uh, then Mercury or Hermes, and Jove or Zeus, uh, that's the, where we get the word deity, you know, um, Deus Piter, you know, means God the Father, you know, and, and that come that's a sort of a shortened version of Zeus, Zeus, which be, later became Deus, and then you have Venus, and then Saturn, okay, uh, and those are the seven planets. Now, um, the seven planets were supposed to have been, uh, you know, it's very interesting that the, uh, the Babylonians uh, developed, um, their religion came out of as astronomy. And I think one of the aspects of it, it is, the, is that there's not a lot of landmarks. Now, you know, in Australia, um, the, uh, every noun has an adjective that tells you how far away is it and what direction it is. So you can't say a noun without telling where it is, you know, and uh, that's because there were not a lot of landmarks in Australia and you can easily get lost. So the language sort of developed based on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, this, uh, um, where is it and in what direction? Well, astronomy also, I mean, in, if you don't have any landmarks, uh, on, on the ocean of desert, you tend to have to navigate by the stars and the sun. So you kind of develop your religion out of the stars and the sun, you know, and I mean, this is just a guess. <laughs> this is just a guess. But the, uh, but the Babylonians, uh, you know, had their ziggurats, always had these seven levels to them, you know, and uh, the seven heavens, you know, and uh, um, Oh, Mars is Aries. Yes, you're right. Uh, but um, Ath Athena is uh, warlike, I think, too, though. Uh, we're going to talk about her in a second. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, these uh, seven planets with their specific deities, these are specific archetypes. Um, now, uh, then he, he comes up, she, he starts talking about Robert Flood. And Robert Flood is somebody we're going to talk about a little more in a bit. He's an alchemist who lived uh, in the uh, 15, 1600s. Um, the seven tones of the scale are to music what the seven planetary gods and goddesses are to the soul and cosmos. What the seven tones of the diatonic scale are to music are what the seven planetary gods and goddesses, the seven archetypal energies that have been differentiated made distinct and separated, uh, uh, mean to soul. So the psychotherapist as musicus, as a musician, must have an ear 
for the temperament that is um, the, di the differentiation of, of archetypal energies and the harmony which resonate deep within the melodic personal events of one's life. You know, have an ear for the temperament and harmony which resonate deep within. And now this is, this is looking at life as a song, our life. Our life is a song, and it's it's a it's a long symphony. And uh, what what has happened in the symphony so far? So to become familiar with the gods of polytheistic mythology is to and to distinguish them carefully uh, is to discover the scale or scale tones of which life experience was composed or evolved. So. Um, well, let's get into, I'm, I'm running out of time here, but uh, let's get into Marsilio Piccino. Um, he was both a music, a music, uh, music therapy and musical therapy, he did both. And most of his uh, work was um, aimed at training imagination and memory in various ways. Now, this is something the alchemists always strive for is, um, is relentless memory, you know, I mean, everything that you do, you need to have in mind all at once, you know, like, like this, you know. I mean, that is uh, this idea of, a, of a training the imagination and memory in various ways, you know, to make analogs more accurately, to make be metaphorical more accurately and subtly and to be able to describe a situation in its depth uh, with more um, uh, exactness. So um, the, uh, you're distinguishing the elemental factors in experience and then set about keeping as much of the polycentrism of life as possible. Now, this is from Ficino. Uh, a healthy soul is one which is most like the sky it's filled with many distinct moving forms okay now this was uh, uh you know something joseph campbell brought up in the fire sermon of the buddha you know he says uh he says um the seeing of the eyes is a burning fire the hearing of the ears is a burning fire the lust of the senses is a burning fire and the Buddha says, quench that fire. But Young said, I mean, Campbell says, not in the West. Feed that fire. Feed that fire. So the idea is we're filling uh, our life with moving forms. So one method uh, Ficino developed, uh, you know, um, uh, sorting out ordinary music according to the character. Or, uh, corresponding to the planetary gods. Certain music was Venusian, some was uh, solar, some was lunar, some was Saturnalian, some was Jovian. And when a person knew himself to be lacking in the qualities or benefits of a particular deity, if he listened to the music appropriate to that, it might bring the peculiar power or the spiritus of that god uh, uh, bring it back, but that's not exactly what happens. Ficino had a, a more sophisticated picture. And, uh, uh, but certain music conveys the character of particular deities. And uh, so um, uh, it, it is uh, used to constellate within a person the quality of all these internal deities. They don't have to be Greek deities establishing a psychological scale of temperament. And, and that was one of his favorite word is tempering. It's differentiate. Uh, it's, it's being aware of these energies within us and, and saying, now I'm depressed, but I'm not exactly depressed the same way I was yesterday. It's a different kind of depression, you know? I mean, and to be able to differentiate that, you know, like the, the Eskimos have 400 different words for snow and the um indians have 400 words they're feel they're, they're the feeling functioned champions of the world 
they have 400 different words for the word love. You know, I mean, they, you know, brother love is not the same as sister love, you know, and fatherly love is not the same as motherly love. And, you know, I mean, all these loves are, are different. So, um, so health is achieved by tempering one's soul in the same way as the zodiac is tempered. You know, in other words, you're, uh, what really I think this is, is distancing. You know, I mean, you, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just very angry. Okay, draw a picture of the angry, put it over here. Okay, okay, yeah, that's my anger, but I guess that's over there, it's, I'm here. So my anger is over here. Now draw the same anger a month from now. It's not gonna look the same. And then you can compare and contrast uh, this idea. But the whole idea is to create this uh, tempered uh, zodiac inside yourself. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, I was thinking of the well-tempered clavier when I was hearing of this. This was a, a song by Bach. And if you never heard it, go listen to it. Now, the guy that invented the piano hated the clavier or the harpsichord because you couldn't control how loud you played. So instead of plucking the strings, he came up with the piano, which hammers them. And now you can play loud, you know. But um, anyway, uh, you run into this problem with Pacino's tempering is that um, playing a lunar tune is not going to get you back into temperament of the lunar. It's, it's too easy. It's excessively ego-oriented. The solution is found in the subtleties uh, of, of what he's saying. Um, that um, if you play um, a, uh, a lunar uh, music, um, it, will, um, uh, it will make you conscious of what lunar music sounds like. And so when, um, so imagination is awake to when lunar movements stir, and so one can consciously recognize it and cooperate with that movement when it does appear. You know, so Ficino uh, suggests uh, that our involvement in the world when it is imaginative in this way, which really is, is unbelievably highly conscious of all the movements within our psyche and greeting them with, uh, you know, uh, welcoming you know he i mean every every even if it's a bad one oh this is interesting let's let's what is this one like so it graces our psychological life with this uh polycentry uh polycentricity of spirit that adds both resonance and tone that it wasn't there before when we weren't conscious of it so in the process of tempering ego um, we are not the Senex king reigning with full control and purpose, but we move in the manner of an artist, an aesthetic ego, you know, one that is saying, ah, you know, first of all, it realizes that these energies that are, are roiling it aren't it, you know, it's saying, oh, I'm angry, but isn't that an interesting specimen of my anger? You know, it's this slight difference than it was. You know, I mean, the idea is to uh, create, uh, uh, you're, you're this musician, this aesthete, uh, aesthetic ego attempts um, at once to create an experience and deeply resonant life, yet recognizing the necessities. Now, this is so important for cooperation and receptivity in the presence of transpersonal movements. In other words, we listen to the lunar music, not to uh, force the moon to come, the lunar energies to come to us, but we now will be aware of them when they do come, and then we can watch their movement. So Pacino's own experience was with Saturn, which was this uh, prominent in his horoscope in his life. Now, Saturn, I can read about the, the seven energies of the gods, but um, he knew he couldn't change his dominant, but he told other people, well, why don't you expose yourself to Venusian or, or Jovian objects as an antidote? And, and, but he concluded the only real way 
to deal with Saturn in your life is to get into its sphere without <laughs> reserve or with no fear to get into it and be aware of it. So um, now he tells the story of the judgment of Paris um, and would point out the problem which arise when one consciously chooses one archetypal energy or one God over another. Uh, his universal rule when faced with the choice as with Paris uh, as uh, is, well, you know, uh, all three of the goddesses, I guess there was Hera, Athena, and, uh, um, and Aphrodite offered in gifts. Uh, this, this, this woman of discord brings the golden apple and it says on it, to the fairest one, you know? And so Zeus couldn't decide who to give it to. So he knew Paris was very fair. So he had Paris decide. And uh, Athena promised him, uh, you know, uh, excellence in war, fame in war, and uh, 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 Hera, Hera uh, promised him, I forget what she promised him, uh, so, something. And then, oh, oh, riches or something. And, uh, uh, and Aphrodite promised him Helen of Troy. You know, the most beautiful woman on earth. And uh, uh, for, he, for some reason, picked uh, her. But uh, it, according to tradition, there was no doubt who was the fairest one. It was cow-eyed uh, Hera. <laughs> that was the tradition. The cow-eyed Hera was the most beautiful of the three. So uh, that wasn't not, he was not very fair. I don't know who, who came up with that, but she was known as cow-eyed Hera. Uh, so anyway, um, now, uh, then we, we quickly will go into, I might go over just a little bit on this, just so we finish it today, is dissonance. Um, now dissonance, uh, the, the idea is um, that, you know, uh, that, um, what, what is, uh, we think is being sought is stability in harmony, stability, evenness, calm, order, control, happiness, and peace. These are not the goals of musical therapy. Dissonance has its place uh, because it's the actual, it is the energizing function. You know, you have two poles you, the farther they are apart, the greater the energy they can create. Uh, in music, uh, sound dissonance creates climax, provides expressiveness, and gives bite and spice to what otherwise would be a, a bland, uh, safe, unsavory uh, tone. So, uh, um, you know, the most dissonant um, uh, tones used to be that what was called the tritone or the diminished Fifth, um, it was called the Dioblis in Musica. You listen to Theolonius Monk. That's all he plays is that, bong, you know, I mean, if all of his music is using this uh, tritone. So in Musica Humana, dissonance may be devilish and shadowy, but it also lends interest and motion. Okay. You know, isn't that beautiful? Just what is considered dissonant in music has evolved over the centuries. Um, and uh, it is, uh, um, you know, what, what was dis, dissonant? Well, they mentioned that one uh, that used to be very dissonant, which was, um, is now uh, the, uh, is, is, is very consonant in, in modern music. So we'll quickly uh, go over Robert Flood. Um, he's the alchemist, but uh, I'm just going to show his diagrams. Um, the uh, diagrams. For, well, first he has uh, um, this uh, idea of the of the temple musica, you know, and uh, it is. Uh, let's see here. Okay, here it is, and. Uh, here are the three organs. One plays the uh, plays the music of the instruments that we hear. The second is the one of nature, the music of nature, and the third is the music of, of the soul. Okay, and uh, uh, then he has uh, um, 
the one that was even more interesting, which we can talk about uh, at length, is uh, is uh, his, his uh, uh, on the in, on the interval numbers and the harmony of men. And suddenly my uh, my thing doesn't want to work. Let me see if I can get it again. There we go. Okay, let me see if I can get this up here. All right, now let's talk about this one. Okay, now this is um, Robert Flood was this unbelievably, uh, he made all these diagrams. I mean, they're just incredibly insightful. I mean, these guys were amazing, but the, it, it is a diagram shows explicitly that the soul consists of three octaves. The bottom one is the material octave, uh, the, and the second is the mediating octave, and the third is the spiritual octave. And in this chart, the human body lies at the base of the three octaves and is described as the vessels of all three. Okay. Now, uh, within the material octave are air, earth, and air and water. In the mediating octave are the seven planets and the fixed stars and the prime mover. And in the highest octave is, now I might be pronouncing this wrong, but it is the diapason, diapason. And this is just the glorious uh, uh, moment of, 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 of celestial harmony. It just explodes into some, uh, uh, you, know, you know, possibly uh, ode to joy, you know, a certain movement would have a, a diap, what would be described as a diapason. And they um, are the ranks of uh, the, the nine angels. Um, now, uh, which really are the muses. You know, Plato turned, uh, the nine muses were supposed to be the ones who turned the seven heavens. You know, they're the ones who put them in motion. But um, there was nine of them and seven planets. And, and so Talia is the one who's on earth. She's called silent Talia. You know, I always love that word, silent Talia. And she, because earth is silent, it doesn't move. It's the fixed point, you know, and all the, even the sun revolves around the earth, you know. And uh, uh, so um, she's known as silent Talia, but you can hear her in the forest. Um, so then you had one of the, uh, the muses became of the fixed stars outside the seven planets. So now you got one, everybody's got their own seat. But then Plato, you know, um, added wings to them. And so he said they were the sirens. They were not the muses, they were the sirens, you know. And, uh, but then it became a kind of an argument about what type of wings do they have? Well, everyone said they're swan's wings. But then um, if you look at fairies, fairies don't have swan wings, they have dragonfly wings, you know. So, so it's this interesting, little uh, history of winged uh, humans is, and why, how they got their wings. It's kind of interesting. So the angels are really, you, you know, in, initially, Michael, Gabriel, all these angels, they did not have uh, wings. You know, it was only later that they uh, sort of adopted. And, you know, Christianity accepted all these cosmologies as given, just as they would accept science as given, you know. And uh, so somehow they did uh, have this, um, you know, way of, of, of emerging, you know, but um, so uh, my, Michael and Gabriel, uh, you, know, you know, Gabriel, the one who blows his horn, you know, he doesn't blow the horn to wake the dead. He blows the horn to wake your dead soul. That's what you'll hear in alchemy. The blow, the, the horn of Gabriel is to awaken our dead soul. Our soul is dead. Waken it. And so it's not wakening the physical dead. It's waken the dead in us. You know, so um, this, this is, uh, so, so let's just kind of uh, finish this. Um, the overtones, okay. The, when, when there is a uh, string is, is hit, a particular piano string, it has overtones that produce halves and thirds. They're called the upper partials. So um, 
the, the body, which is the vessel of psyche, which is soul and spirit, body is the fundamental tone. Spirit, which, by the way, does not have subtle body, and soul, which does have subtle body. That's how you can discriminate against them. You are born with soul. Your soul and, and your ego came into being at the same time, you know, and share a life. So, and the, so the soul has a subtle body. You know, they always say that when the body dies, it changes a little bit in weight, you know, because this psychoid soul, which is real and living, has come out and made the body, you know, everybody's trying to find out how much does soul weigh, you know, where spirit is disembodied. It has no body. And see, that's, that's, the, that's the problem with the Puer Eternus is they live in the disembodied realm. You know, and when I'm up in space, you know, I say, uh, uh, I say, well, I don't need feet here. I think I'll just cut them off and put them in a chirogenic freezer. You know, I don't need feet here. And the soul says, those are not so easy to put back. So anyway, um, the idea is, uh, I'm just going to read this, what I read at the beginning again, uh, that the musical therapist is a person who has an ear for the psychological overtones and events represented especially by the planetary gods who are the archetypal images behind everything that happens to us. He has an ear for the spiritual overtones, the angelic connecting, analogical uh, subtle and volatile links between body and soul. And he draws on the imagery that we've discussed. Uh, and, uh, dis and so we can describe the uh, musical therapist as one who perceives the tuning of soul, distinguishes its tonality, the basic spheres or tones, which constitutes its deep-seated scale. And he appreciates consonance and dissonance as desirable ingredients of the soul's music. He has an aesthetic attitude towards the function of ego. You know, the, the, the function of ego is to be an aesthetic one. It's not to be the victim. It's to be the artist of life. You know, it's to be, you are, your life is to be a work of art. And your ego is to be the artist in that work of art. And not go around feeling like the victim. You know, uh, it is, it, it, and uh, that's just a wonderful concept. Um, he evaluates the patterns and movements of the soul. He becomes conscious of them, really, uh, as to uh, whether they are fitting and appropriate rather than natural, moral, or normal. So there's no mention of sin. Is it fitting or appropriate? And for the musical therapist, a personal life is not a story, but it's a melody, expressive and moving. And it's a composition of many, many melodies in harmony and counterpoint. Uh, long or short, massively orchestrated or played with simplicity behind the tunes of, the, of our life, the events of our life, sound the pre-compositional archetypal modes and scales. And this is the human music and it gives life its tone and resonance. And with musica humana in mind, Shakespeare uh, had this from the Merchant of Venice. He was an alchemist too. The man that hath no music in himself, nor is moved uh, with the concord of sweet sounds, is fit only for treasons, stratagems, and spoils of thievery. The motions of his spirit are as dull as the night. You know, so that's kind of the, uh, I, I kind of a little bit rushed through it, and I'm sorry. I just wanted to, uh, uh, Try to get it done today, uh, but um, so we could go on. But I wanted to show you one quick thing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Gary. Since uh, let me see if I can find this thing here. Um, just a oh yeah, this this was a dream I had. Okay, and uh, it was that there was a great music which came up in volumes, but whose harmonious forces are out of balance making a disharmonious music, which was even more deeply meaningful. 
some disharmonious music. The darkest of winds um, over here on the right uh, comes, came and demanded the surrender of the creator of the disharmony, a beautiful human being connected with the heart of all music. Well, this would be the aesthetic ego, you know. Uh, the castle and its inhabitants were reluctant to turn him over to the, to the wind and afraid of the moon power, which would then take over the music and the telling of the tale. And the creator of disharmony was uh, summoned unwillingly. And there was a woman who was described as the locus of the center. And she was the anima, the soul. And she was placed on the pedestal and left alone to face the coming of the dark wind, dangerous and ominous, yet beautiful. And as the wind left with this uh, beautiful man, he and the woman of the center were held briefly together for a moment with death in his shrouds, and it was unbearable. There was no joy left, much tempered <laughs> by the absence of the life force. But later at the end of the dream, I find this uh, beautiful man and the woman are just sleeping in a room. And I'm just uh, wondering, uh, what are they doing here? You know, uh, and what was all this about? Anyway, that was a little dream I had. That, um, so anyway, I'm sorry that it, I overran, but Gary, you're, do you wanna see what everybody has to say? We yeah, wow, what a dream. I mean, we could spend the whole thing on that. I mean, darkest of the winds, you know, I mean, geez. Um, you know, this kind of reminds me of one of my my strange experiments with my yoga instructor. We were going on a walk and I said, okay, for any conversation that we have, we're going to sing it. So, you know, you had to converse by singing. and. You know, and that, well, you know, first off, it, it brought up a lot of vulnerability because basically anything, you know, that you're saying, singing, you know, you've got emotions behind it that are coming out. And so it, you know, it, it moves you away from the analytic, you know, the rational to some extent. And, 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 you know, and I wonder if this whole therapy isn't a way for that, you know, for the therapist to get the analyst in to agree that this is not going to be a talking therapy. You know, he is, the therapist is going to be listening, you know, more with the heart and that the work that's to be done is you know how how to listen to the missing parts because the, the missing parts you know they have you know a particular vibration or a particular harmony and that's and, 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 and that's what they're not aware of. And the question is, and, and generally you can't, you can't become aware of those with the analytical mind because it was the analytical mind that separated you from all of this in the first place. So how do you do it? You know, you can do it maybe ear. through, well, yeah, yeah ear. Says you have to develop a good ear, whatever that yeah. means. Yeah, and I and I guess on the analyst sands part, you know, it's either it's either through dance or movement or you know learning how to move from from the head to the heart, how to listen to the body, how to how to become grounded. I mean, you know, just there's there's so many ways to approach the inferior functions. But this is this is all about you know it sounds to me like this is all about putting the inferior function front and center. And, and saying that, you know, this isn't going to be a word cure. It's like creating a zodiac within you. I mean, who came up 
with the fact that uh, Taurus was uh, the age of, of 2000 BC and, and before, and that Aries, I mean, was the, was the, the ram, was the age uh, uh, from 2000 to zero. And, you know, that was this person who uh, had a good ear for, for the inner world. Or, you know, a good ear for the, uh, it was a revelation. It had to be, you know, how this, this all came about. But how do we, how do we uh, design a zodiac uh, for our own psyche? You know, being this artist, not the victim. The ego is the aesthetic artist. Yeah, well, Aline, would you like to uh, comment? Sure. Um, when you were talking about Edinger and you had that, um, mem- you know, that visual of all the different associations, how the psyche wraps around all the possibilities, I couldn't help but think about the disharmony in the in the church and in the institutions. You know, I was always looking at schools and institutions, the family, all this, but the church. We learned in the seminary, the early church had not only blood, the blood of Christ, bread representing the body, but it had milk. There were women priests in the early church and uh, milk just represented whatever you think it would be, you know, kindness, I suppose, sucker, nurturing, that kind of thing. And the church lost that. You know, what happened? I don't know. Maybe it was the, the age, you know, that the wrong uh, the wrong uh, sign of the age you know the astrological age that first thousand years i mean it's the the idea of of, i think that there was an evolutionary purpose in the west now remember we're only talking about the west for the first thousand years of, of christianity and that was to become very very disembodied you know the idea of air of of mithra uh, sacrificing the bull and and the ram being sacrificed this idea of sacrificing the animal within us you know is then followed by uh this uh, unbelievably uh disembodied spiritual uh uh um, attitude differentiating tempering you know and and yet it, it it needed to go way way too far away from the body and, and so instead of, of pan, you know, the goat horned, goat uh, feet uh, representative as the son of the, of the great mother in nature, he becomes a symbol of the great mother in nature of the body. And then becomes, he, he is then tinted red and becomes the devil, you know, uh, in in uh, he's representative of the body so this was sort of a symbol of how much they wanted to get away from the body and become disembodied and all these men who go in the cloisters you know i mean basically they're trying to get away from the bodily existence and even women who went into cloisters at that time you know there's the idea of we we need to that there a psychological movement of 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 moving away from body. And then in the second half of that era, um, it, it suddenly becomes the age of the anti-self. The first, it's the horizontal fish. You know, the first one's the vertical fish, the horizontal fish. Uh, now uh, it's the age of discovery, the age of science, and the age of ego. And you only created that. And this, I, I think, is the only way that you're going to get uh, uh, is to create this great distance from ego and the body. And I think that, that in the West, that this was a, a, an evolutionary need is to go way, you know, the pendulum need to swing way far in this direction, you know. Now, and so it swung way away from the feminine as far as it could go because she represents earth. Now, remember, this is a feminine energy. It's not a woman. It's feminine energy, and there's feminine energy in, in me, and there's masculine energy in a, in a woman. Uh, I'm, I'm less conscious of the feminine energy in me, you know, than, than because it's, um, I, I've been y- using as my right hand the masculine energy. 
you know, and, and not using my left hand, which is more the feminine energy in me anyway. But the, the idea was that, I, I don't know, I'm trying to put a positive spin on it. It's not that positive because <laughs> now, now what do we do? You know, I mean, we're, uh, you know, turning and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon can't hear the falcon are, you, you know, the world's falling apart. Mere anarchy has come on the world because now the ego thinks it's God. It, it doesn't, uh, it, you know, God is dead, okay? If God is dead, then who is God now? There is a God. And if God is dead, then what that is a statement of is ego is God, you know? And this was in the second uh, half of, of, uh, of Pisces. The devil did not, was no longer pan tinted red. He was now... Mephistopheles, okay? He was this, he was this magician, this shaman. Cat, uh, uh, you were talking about the shamans uh, didn't seem to want, well, the problem is the shamans, they're all, a lot of them are just full of trickery. And so is Mephistopheles, and so is the ego. You know, I mean, this is, this is what we heard all about in the Handless Maiden, you know, is that her, uh, the, the, uh, the miller would would trade his his feeling function for the trickery of the mechanical, you know. I mean, and and this is this is really he didn't give up his daughter; he gave up his soul. So he is now has is has no soul anyway. Uh, Aline, as far as the individuals and in churches, I, you can go into, you know, you can I can take any religion and find people in it who are uh, abhorrible, you know, abhorrent, you know. So I, I, I can't really talk about people, but if you just talk about the general movements, what, Aline, uh, now tell me if I answered your question. Oh, yeah, that was great. Yeah. I just, it just struck me when you showed that Edinger diagram, and I saw it a couple of times, there was semen on it, there was blood, there was everything but milk it just it really got to me you know yeah that is it is milk you, you know this is the idea of of milk i mean who is um uh who, who is is the great mother i mean she's just covered with um breasts because she is this nurturing aspect this nurturing aspect the one you know who no matter what i mean you know, there's justice and mercy, okay? When the church became overly uh, on, uh, too much on the righteousness and justice side, there's no mercy anymore. I mean, there's the idea of no matter who you are and what you did, I forgive you and I will nurture you. You know, I mean, uh, there's is this aspect of, of uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it is, it is not... Uh, it is, it, it is, is soulless. Let's put it that way. The spirit is spiritual, since it doesn't have body in it, is really a little soulless. You know, it's too spiritual. The, the soul is feminine in both men and women. You know, according to Marion Woodman, you know, uh, she's the one person I've heard that said that. But yes, it is, I think it is soulless. Because it does not is, it is not uh, where where Marie Louise von Franz would say about all these intellectual giants. Where's the anima? Where's the soul? Where's the milk? Where's the milk of human kindness? In this? Now, I I don't think that's missing from the Dalai Lama to some extent. I mean, it's, I don't know. I don't know. He's uh, he's a little uh, wears he wears saffron robes. It's your death garb. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm spec. I'm rambling. So, I'm uh, Kat, would you uh, like to go next? Yes. Hmm. You'll need to unmute. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was just so involved in what you're saying, Craig, and I was just all, you know, disappeared. But um. I want to share something with you, or hope you don't mind, 
but it kind of adds on to what you've been talking about, Craig and Eileen. And it's a um, poem that I've done from a dream uh, symbol. And um, I, I attended this um, course, um, Dreaming on the Page, and it was taught by my teacher, Sylvia Gober. And what she does is gets us to write dreams and poems, I'm sorry, poems and stories from our dreams. So this is one I had created because I keep having reoccurring dreams about snakes. So I want to share with you snakes story, if that's okay. It's very quick, so I won't be too long. Okay. Um, the It's called Once We Are Dragons, Now Look At Me. <sighs> okay. It's early morning and the ground is soft and full of dew. Sunlight dappling through the trees. A quiet time for me. I glide my slinky body, gently touching the earth. I'm hungry and I'm ready to strike. But as I go about my way, I think of greater times, a time of my ancestors, life-giving principles of nature, a time when we had legs and took to the skies and with our roar and fire breath took a fat cow and men quivered. But alas, things change as inevitably they do. Gone on my legs and full belly. This happened long ago to my tribe. We became long worms of sea and cave. And then, 2,000 odd years ago, a great, 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 too many to count great, Auntie Maud showed a fair woman an apple. She didn't mean any harm. She wanted the woman to know the ways of earth and creation. Disaster, he bellows and assigns me and my kind the snakes of generation. Generations of cursing women folk with blood and childbirth, cursing men to be brutish and weak-minded. And me and my kind designated to be stamped upon, chased upon, beaten with sticks, always known as a, a deceiver and a liar. And now all my power is gone to strike at the feet and strike at the soul, never again to know the majesty of me. Well, no matter if this is the way it's to be, then fine. I'll make sure I strike them where they gently stroll through long grasses and I'll strike them and give them nightmarish dreams. Oh, look, I see movement, an unsuspecting mouse, a juicy morsel for my tea. And with lightning strike position, I claim my innocent prize. Right, off I go now to retire under an unbiased rock. I am full and a bit sleepy. I will sleep now fearless of being disturbed. And I'll dream a dream, a dream of old times, a dragon's dream, a dream of the splendor of me. Powerful. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> that was wonderful. awesome. That's wonderful. It's just, the snake is such a mysterious being. I mean, it's just absolutely, uh, uh, you know, Young, Young said that the, the uh, tree in the Garden of Eden, or the snake, was the newman of the tree, or it was the voice of the tree. But I don't know. It's just a, such a mysterious. I mean, I, everyone has dreams about snakes. But it, it is interesting how it uh, dreams about having legs. But <laughs> so <laughs> that was, you, you had a dream, and then you, you wrote a kind of a, an act of imagination around it? Is that what that was? Um, well, I've, I've dreamt of snakes for a very long time, and it was um, part of a course um, exercise was to pick a dream um, character that we wanted to sp let speak as such, but oh. I was going to pick a fairy or something like that, and it was kind of like, no, snake, and then all of a sudden it was just sort of 
this story or it's its story sort of come gushing out really but it's the way the the course was struck in um constructed constructed sorry it's quite skillfully that kind of allowed this upsurge to of creativity to come out really nice thank you yeah really good uh diane would you like to go next well i'm just sort of flabbergasted by the synchronicity of this being the first time that i joined you because uh, in my early life, you know, I began studying music and I exhibited some talent and I, but I wasn't disciplined enough. And I went on to study at the University of Texas, by the way, music, and I wanted to um, get a degree in uh, ethnic, ethnomusicology, but it wasn't available where I was. It was very rare at the time. And so I've always thought in my next life, I want to be a musician. And when I usually when I go to the study groups, I can barely write a few notes. I could not stop writing. It was so. And this is so interesting to me. I hope we're going to continue with this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diane. I sent you the uh, link to it. It will have that. Great, great. Yeah. Fascinating background. Uh, Dahlia, do you have something for us? Yes, I think I just had some ideas I, I wrote down about actually my, my father wanted me to play the music. I remember I was very little. He wanted me to play the music, but he didn't play music himself himself so it was very uh, and it's when while we were talking i had so many memories like uh, coming to the surface i didn't pay any attention for a while so i think i'll i know there are many things just uh, coming to the surface and um, and i also have a music teacher we i know we have a friendship for like i know uh, 20 years now, something like that. And I really love how she, when we go to the concert and she speaks what she, oh, she speaks about the colors of the, 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 the mm. pioneers, how he played. And I know I like listening to the music, but I like, to, I like her talking even more because I, I don't have that internal something which I could, you know, to, to feel, to analyze or to understand to, and to, 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 to see the music in this way. So I know it's very fascinating for me. And, uh, but I can feel the music. Um, I know, like there's impressionist music and there's impressionist paintings. So that's quite uh, close, I don't know, to, to, to relate to to feel the 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 the, the, the vibrancy of uh, I don't know so uh, yes and I have now I have many 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 thoughts and like about yeah about the, my father more even than the, than the music but uh, so thank you for the for the for the yeah for this how to say change of the subject for a little because I know we. You had the idea to, to change it. But yeah, that's very yeah, what critical. Was, what was so interesting about that, Dan, is that, you know, you're talking about, you know, how you could see the music in, in a different way when you're with your music teacher. And, uh, you know, and that makes me, you know, it just gave me the feeling for like, oh, you know, this is how, you know, those therapists, maybe that's how they're perceiving the music of the soul and their patients. And that's the type of thing that's going through their mind and the colors and, and, and that type of thing. So, you know, your response with feeling, you know, was actually very enlightening. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, Von, who was it that uh, said uh, Helen Keller used to sit there 
and hold on. You know, Helen Keller was blind and deaf, but she she would hold a, a speaker really close to herself when they would play Mozart or something. And she just would feel the vibrations of the diaphragm and the speaker. You know, so I, and it awakened uh, something beautiful in her too. I think so there's I mean, also yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, no, Dania. I think, I think there's something quite close when because I know my teacher, she also wrote a book for the uh, autist children, and it's called like uh, the uh, colorful sounds or something like that, yes. and they teach it through the colors. And there are also many artists, genius people who also they they create with color and with music. So I don't know. I'm I'm mixed up in this, but. Uh, uh, that's it, I think. Yeah, I don't know what to... I can't elaborate, just the idea. Said, do you all have, have something for us? Hello, everybody. What a fantastic group we have today. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Gary, for um, asking that question, how to hear, how to listen to the missing part. That was a poem, <laughs> so beautiful. And um, 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 I typed syn synesthesia in the chat. This is something uh, that some people experience. They see, when they hear notes, when they hear music, they see colors. And um, I had this experience twice. Um, it was fantastic, I couldn't repeat it. But when I was listening to music, I could hear, I could see the colors that was in front of my eyes. It was this vision of bursting colors. There was. And today, um, when you were speaking about um, music of our life, our lives, I was um, looking at the object around me in this room, plants, glass, uh, doors and um, it could be a nice practice to try to listen to these objects as notes because everything has a sound to it everything has a frequency and even when a person enters your life when you meet someone um uh, you can do this meditation, this contemplation of hearing the, the voice, you know, how this person sounds. And um, I was thinking about my bells and they were, <laughs> they sounded like drums, <laughs> you know. So uh, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic concept to... And I think at some point, all these sensations, hearing, listening, touching, at some um, place, they all become one. And maybe um, soul is the seat of that, uh, is the seat that this happens, the vessel that it happens there. The whole thing is really poetic to me. It's really poetic and... Um, I'm excited to practice it as a kind of awareness, as a kind of, as a, as a way of knowing, a way of tacit knowledge. It's fantastic. You should remind ourselves to practice it in this group. Thank you so much for this. That's uh, why I, uh, I thought, I mean, it just seemed like it was so urgent. For me <laughs> that uh you couldn't it, hold it <laughs> yeah, i couldn't hold it i was just here here's what uh azine was describing which is so cool because this is what dalio is talking about there are people who hear in color that they have colors come what when they hear and that's what they also see numbers and letters and colors and words have certain colors that they could see that word is, uh, you, you know, and and I knew somebody 
uh, I mean, I didn't know him personally, who, who would see colors of different people, you know? And if they were, you know, he, when he saw a certain color, he knew that they were about to die, you know, whether they knew it or not. But I mean, that's uh, just a, a way of seeing, you know, I mean, it's, uh, and, and, and the idea I think is you don't, uh, let's just finish up with this little aspect. And, and why it, it was a, uh, you know, life uh, uh, urgent. Oh, oh, and Dawn, I wanted to say hi to Dawn. She doesn't usually like to talk, but uh, she's, she has a very rich uh, dream life. It's amazing. But anyway, it is, uh, is that you aren't, you are an aesthetic, as an ego, you are to be an aesthetic force uh, in your life. You know, you are to, uh, to be the artist of all the energies and you need to be, to, you need to temper the scale of all these energies that you feel within yourself and be differentiating and feel them just like the one who felt the kundalini yoga and and felt uh the movement of this snake in the spinal <laughs> cord. but anyway um we can uh i thought now unless um i thought we'd finish the feminine in fairy tales because i think it speaks so much to all of us we'll just there aren't that many more uh fairy tales but well, i think there's two or three and then after that, uh, we can just vote on things. I tend to like one that covers uh, dreams or visions or, but you know, I, I, I've been thinking too, that we might want to learn about uh, Hermes or in the spirit Mercurius too, or something. But anyway, we'll, we'll uh, let's decide that um, uh, as a group, what we want to do after this. So anyway, well, I think, I think, isn't Christmas on Sunday this year? I think, you know, isn't it? Christmas Eve is, is Saturday or Christmas is Sunday? It's uh, Saturday. Christmas Saturday. Eve is Friday. So okay. Sunday is the 26th. Well, I, we, I can have a very, uh, we can just skip that day if you want. Uh, or uh, I don't know. I mean, everybody's going to be probably pretty busy. Yeah, I've got visitors leaving yeah. that day. So yeah, so why don't we um, just just for uh, the twenty sixth, we'll um, you know uh, you know skip that. I, I I'd hate to do it. It's but, Boxing Day in England. Yes, it's <laughs> Boxing Day. That. My husband's English. Yeah, we celebrate well, I, Boxing Day. Yeah, I can I can come on here at at, at around eleven if anybody wants to do a dream session. I can just open it up and if anybody wants to come, but it it's just depends on how, how busy you are. I know we're going to have like 30 people here, so Whoa. But they seem to let me alone. <laughs> well, anyway, well, thank you, Diane. I Please come back. I, I can't oh, wait yes, to I will. hear more I'm about excited. you. I'm yeah, excited. And Azim, you know, one thing, Azim, Pythagoras came from Samos, and that's very near uh, well, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, if you knew anything about, you came from that part of the world, but if, you, if you've ever what? been to uh, He was called the Sage of Samos, Pythagoras. And that's right off the coast of Turkey. I just didn't know if you had it. Okay. He lived far from the gods, but in his mind, he was at home with them. That's what they used to say about him. So huh. anyway, Pythagoras. well, everybody, yeah, everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. And We'll start on the feminine fairy tales next week then. Okay. All Thank right. you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Later. Thank you. Bye. Then, uh, Craig, could you send the could you email the diagrams that you shared here? Oh, yes. that would be wonderful. Yeah. I will. Yes. Thank it's, you. It's yeah, I think it's from Ego and Archetype. I'd edit you, but I will I'll send okay. it. And the ones uh by Robert Flood, too, which are very good. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank Merry okay. Christmas, well, thanks, everyone. Everybody. Merry Christmas. We'll see you uh, next uh, Sunday, hope. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.